Hi, Jake. I did actually test it today. Um, I recorded it for 15 minutes, deleted, um, reset. It should have emptied the trash can. I don't know what the fuck's happened. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, hi, Jacob. Um, thank you for welding these two together. So, we were at the point where we were talking about the IWW as a revolutionary union. So, they wanted an industrial commonwealth, which is kind of like the cooperative commonwealth we talked about a couple of weeks ago in Australian Ideas. Um, their idea of a new future society was based around the abolition of work and wages, but also the same big factories that they idolised. So when they were talking about an industrial commonwealth, they included um, agriculture, they included manufacturing, they included transport, they included human services. They are one of the first union movements ever through um, Father O'Haggerty's Wheel of Industry, a great ideal wheel of six great union bodies within the one big union. They included service work and white-collar work as real work, and these days they've um, thought a fair bit more about that, and the wheel is bigger within the segments, but the same segments remain. Um, the American IWW was successful in industry and did want to achieve a revolution to get there, but honestly, that wasn't what made them strong. They had a strong newspaper basis, they had a strong song basis, which is very important in the period. It's kind of like controlling radio today. But um, what they um, had was young, unemployed men going town to town, moving between jobs that you could get easily and organising on the job, moving in packs of young men. Women IWWs tended to stay in the same space, so the major strike which women IWW were involved in were the two textile strikes that are available in um, one of the histories of the American IWW by a man whose name I've forgotten at the moment. Um, but anyway, the point is that um, mobile young men who were at the edges of life, moving in packs between industries, could get jobs very easily um, and start organising. And this is not the situation we live in today. Um, uh, they also were multi-tendential. They weren't just socialists. They weren't just anarchists. The organisation was nothing. It wanted an industrial commonwealth through direct action. But they were militant in general. They refused to sign permanent deals with bosses. So we, while we might think that they engaged in enterprise bargaining by bargaining enterprise by enterprise to beat bosses... Our enterprise bargaining agreements in Australia have one clause that I would love to get deleted. No further claims during the lifetime of the agreement. The IWW would fight and win and then go back out and fight again in a very short period of time. Rather than deals, they had truces with bosses. Now, admittedly, between truces, most of what they did was propagandistic organising. So it's not like they are the wonders of industrial organising that we should all love and, and follow. But they did idolise direct action, which means directly targeting the employing class through strikes, through sabotage. Um, and their dream was one great general strike of the entire working class to achieve an industrial commonwealth of cooperation. So that's the American IWW. Fairly industrial, organised as a separate union in opposition to other unions, and highly effective at propaganda. The IWW came to Australia in 1907, just after the Harvester Judgment last week, when the local Delianist Socialist Labor Party, I believe they were called, formed a club. Now, this is before the breakaway between the Detroit and Chicago mobs, but the Chicago spirit of the IWW is being indifferent to political elections of the governments we know and detest, um, started around 1908 and by 1913 was dominant in Australia. The... Delinists became more and more difficult to work with in Australia and eventually formed their own little sect union that went its own way into insignificance. Um, they did do stuff, but it's not the significant IWW in Australia. In contrast, the general Australian IWW was more cooperative with existing unions. Um, part of the impulse to set them up came from the meat workers, who at this time were quite a radical fighting union that didn't like arbitration and wanted to keep fighting bosses locally using direct action. The IWW was active throughout other unions generally as individual activists rather than as a separate union. So if we call the American strategy smashing from without, so destroying the non-revolutionary unions by founding a great 
revolutionary union workers want to go to. The Australian strategy was called boring from within. It's not actually boring, it's quite complex, difficult work, but boring from within like a beetle bores into a tree. This kind of what lefties call entryism was possible because labourism in Australia, the ideology of the labour movement in general aligned with the ALP and kind of soft on whether there should be a revolution or not, labourism was still open to radical action and militancy in a way which closed down definitively by the 1980s, especially in the unions and trades hall. So the Labour Party was always quite conservative in government, but was always more radical in this period in the trades halls, in the ordinary unions. Um, and the bunch we're going to talk about are going to be the trades hall reds in New South Wales, who weren't IWW but were very sympathetic. Part of the reason why the IWW could be successful in this climate as a dispersed group of people is because Australia was radicalising. Australian workers had just been forced to accept arbitration, which was seen as a massive concession by many of the bosses, seen as a massive betrayal by many of, work, many of the working class. But one example of this radicalisation is boyhood conscription. Now, most Australians get the story, there was never conscription in Australia in World War I, which is bullshit. Men under the age of service, boys, were conscripted throughout the period uh, up to 1917, 18, when the system fell over and turned into cadets. And what we mean by boyhood conscription is every young male of a certain age had to be military drilled compulsory, as a compulsory thing. Massive resistance from young working class men. They didn't want a piece of it. What it actually was was a system to put the farm owners' children on horses and teach them to shoot workers. And the labour movement knew this because the guns never turned up to working class schools. They turned up to private schools. They turned up to country schools. Guns never turned up to working class schools. And compulsory boyhood conscription was turned off on and off, but it continued more or less throughout the period as a way of training the elite's children to shoot workers. And the labour movement detested it. They hated the idea of it. In this kind of radical position where people are fighting over social issues rather than industrial issues, the IWW in Australia primarily turned to being a propaganda organisation rather than an industrial organisation as a separate union. So Australian society was extremely conservative. If you went down to the Domain, which is a traditionally a place of free speech in Sydney on Sunday afternoon, and said, God is dead, you could be arrested, unless you had enough people backing you up to stop the cops from getting you and to do a runner. And the IWW throughout Australia fought these free speech fights as a way of working with workers to organise. Um, I'm not sure how effective their newspapers were prior to the war. I don't think they were that effective. But the IWW was always more propagandistic in Australia, talking about the industrial commonwealth we should organise this kind of way, than it was in America where it was a real union. The IWW also had really good politics within the working class, which many people admired. They were deeply anti-war. They were deeply anti-racist. And this is a period when otherwise radical trade unionists are very racist. So the IWW's position on Chinese was let them in on Australian wages, which is a very radical position. Um, this meant that in relation to the semi-bureaucratised union leaderships, like these are guys who have worked on the tools in their life, and worked up until 35 and then got caught out in a strike and then got appointed as a trade union secretary. So people with some contact with actual working life. They admired the IWW in many places. So the trades hall reds, the more militant, the more aggressive, the more socialist, the more anarchistic in the trade union movement officialdom, kind of sponsored them and were backing them and behind them in certain ways. What changed for the IWW in Australia was World War I. They came out anti-war from the beginning. The Labor Party was up in the air um, and eventually very rapidly supported the war. But what the working class in Australia would not tolerate was conscription. The Catholics were against it. And by Catholics, I don't just mean Manx in Melbourne, who was a cardinal, I believe, or an archbishop, a high church figure against this, Irish Catholic, Irish Catholic and influenced by his community. The 
Irish Catholic working class community was against conscription for nationalist reasons in part, but also because of an anti-war mentality. The Labor movement was generally anti-conscription because they viewed it as an imposition on their lives, which meant that they'd end up working for the state for free without getting to choose whether they worked for it. The Victorian Socialist Party was anti-war. The IWW was anti-war. Interesting side story about the VSP, which um, I've heard from a fellow historian, is they held a meeting in the centre of Melbourne, um, no, a ring suburb, but we'd call it inner Melbourne, um, where a whole load of working class youth turned up drunk, we're talking 14 to 22 year olds, and the VSP is trying to talk anti-conscription, and they get booed off stage by the 14 year old to 22 year olds who are drunk, and a riot almost ensues. VSP is very disheartened. Next year, the pro-war forces organise a meeting in the same suburb. Same kids turn up, one year older, 14 year olds involved now, drunk as hell, and kick the pro-war people off stage as well. So, while there was a sense of Britishness and many people enlisted voluntarily, the idea of conscription was really disgusting to the Australian population. The IWW came out against it with really good propagandistic images that um, shocked the equivalent of Channel 7 of the day. We're talking pictures with a soldier crucified on the front page. No text, massive cartoon. Um, and uh, the one which they got sued for, not sued, arrested for, which resulted in a free speech fight, was um, workers follow your masters, in the sense bankers are at home, farmers are at home, bosses are at home, politicians are at home, workers follow your masters, don't go to war. None of the bosses are. At the same time, um, another story off another historian, Australian workers in uniform in Europe started organising industrially in their battalions. So there was a general sense of the possibility of workers controlling society democratically throughout the entire labour movement, including the Australian Labor Party. The IWW was a fair bit more militant in Australia than other groups. Now, here I am a fair bit reliant on Ian Turner's Industrial Labour and Politics, and Ian Turner's Sydney's Burning, an Australian political conspiracy. Um, now, Ian Turner doesn't go the full hog, but what I will say is, in my opinion, the Australian IWW did forge a massive amount of £5 notes and distributed them. I think that we are far enough away from the event to say, without incriminating anybody except the dead, and I don't think it's quite the incrimination, they forged a lot of £5 notes in Australia. Now, £5, um, the household wage for a group of workers in a household was about £3 a week. So we're talking big bickies. We're talking forging um, $2,000 notes here. This is not small money. And a lot of them got issued and used and circulated. I wonder who was issuing them and using them. I don't think it was bosses. I think workers got a lot of sets of about $2,000 worth of living out of this, which is great. Another issue is that the IWW had learnt from the Queensland strikes and used burning, arson. They burnt down wool sheds. Now, I think some of these would have been bosses getting insurance money, but I think that it is fair to say that the IWW was using a traditional Australian working class strategy of arson against the boss. And this kind of stuff resulted in them being politically persecuted. Twelve people got arrested over, I forget which issue it was, five pound note or burning, but twelve of them got arrested and the IWW kind of got caught up in a free speech fight. They were viewed as disgusting and abhorrent and they were eventually made illegal and the underground organisation um, worked to free the um, Sydney 12 and other arrestees. But this needs to be put in the context. IWWs were shooting bosses in Australia and I've read a court case where one of them was executed for that. Um, IWWs in Newcastle at BHP, the massive new American plant run on the new American model, were arrested in Derby Street, which is now a cafe district but would have been a lodging district at the time, with guns and gelignite under the bed. The state picking on them is understandable, given that they were actually revolutionaries in Australia. But at the same time, the state never made its argument as for why it was picking on them. 
It used secret police against them, which were organised through the New South Wales and Victorian um, special branch forces at the time, and with a precursor of what became ASIO. Um, so that's one side, the red side of Labor. Guns under the bed, shooting bosses, willing to take the fight onwards, inspiring fellow Reds in other unions to strike in wartime, fighting conscription referenda. The other side are the rats. So the ALP had achieved government in states and nationally by this time, twice nationally, once independently. Billy Hughes was the ALP Prime Minister who wanted conscription and despite ALP orders, split the ALP to try and get conscription through. The ALP has always had a strong tendency to rat to the right. Now, the ALP has always been a broad church. But I reckon the reason why rats move to the right, why rats run to the right, is because the left know that solidarity is essential. Which also means that for many, many years, many good left-wingers have stayed in the ALP far longer than perhaps they should have out of solidarity, whereas the right... The Britishers, the pro-capitalists, have ratted on the ALP consistently. And this is worth mentioning because then Billy Hughes brings on two conscription fights which are defeated by the working class movement and the anti-war movement. But the Australian state is still under pressure because of the war, even though it's a boom time. They want as much production out of workers as possible. And it doesn't matter that new factories like Harvester exist in Melbourne where people are being controlled through the award system. They want more and more and more, which is the nature of the boss, to sweat workers harder. And in New South Wales, it came to a head when the government changed the New South Wales Railways and tram workers' conditions of work. This is to sweat more labour out of the same pay during war rather than increase wages to get more production. And the railways went out on strike, and the strike became generalised through New South Wales and urban Australia generally. And it put the question really to the wall. Um, the problem is, of course, the strike failed. I don't think the Trades Hall Reds were prepared for it. I don't think the IWW was prepared for it, even though the IWW glorified the general strike. I don't think anybody was prepared for the working class itself in railways and tramways and then throughout the rest of society to kick this kind of thing off. The left had lost faith in the working class to a much greater to a much lesser extent than perhaps today the left has lost faith in the working class's capacity to take action for itself. You know, part of this is the fact that there are networks of red trades hall in officialdom and in local areas, red ALPers, IWWs across the entirety of Australian society working together that a general strike can be kicked off by membership rather than leadership. And this kind of conflict situation where a general strike's defeated in Australia, where a revolutionary organisation is persecuted by the then equivalent of ASIO, by the police, um, led to a situation where after the war the ALP alone was not going to be sufficient to control workers. It also led to a position where the Trades Hall Red, Reds had learnt about the need for unity beyond a single trades hall and between one and another state branch of any particular union. There was also this spirit of one big unionism, which after the IWW was made illegal, was the new claim. One big union, it's not the IWW, but we really would like it to be, kind of. And then the rest of the labour movement takes this, this call up. It comes through the Trades Hall Reds and it comes through rights like the Australian Workers Union. Now, last time we'd seen the Australian Workers Union, they were very radical. They were leading revolutionary action in Shearer's strikes against the government. What a change 30 or 40 years makes when the Australian Workers Union wants the rest of the union movement to dissolve itself into the Australian Workers Union so the more bureaucratised, more right-wing leadership of the Australian Workers Union can control the whole of the working class under their existing orders. Now, the one big unionism eventually led by the 1930s to the formation of the ALP. By the mid-20s, the revolutionary industrial unionist sense that the XIWWs had had been lost from the ALP's now controlled movement towards one big union that led to the ACTU. But 
one of the other things that came out here is a group which we will be talking about more next week in a more radical way than most of us perhaps think of it, the Australian Communist Party, the Communist Party Australia, which was formed by illegal IWWs, trades hall reds, left labourites and people from the former socialist parties. The Australian Communist Party was formed as a revolutionary organisation of the working class's left, not the entire working class, from multiple tendencies. It changed later, but for um, the first seven to ten years, the Communist Party in Australia wasn't that Stalinised. Well, Stalin was not a key figure at the time, but it wasn't controlled internally in the way it was later going to be. But one thing I also have to say, the Communist Party of Australia was not effective. Many of the Trades Hall Reds left the Communist Party of Australia and it decreased over time in this period of lack of struggle. Um, I think that this is all I want to talk about in terms... 20 minutes, all I want to talk about in terms of topics, but I want to end on a couple of issues. Labor in Australia was put to the wall in a way it had never been before, the labor movement, the working class itself. Were they going to be red or were they going to be rat? Were they going to support the British Empire and nationalism or were they going to support peace and an end to conscription? What were acceptable tactics? Should there be guns under the beds? And to end on a win, most of the Sydney 12 got out. They all got sentenced, I believe, but they all got out. And many of them ended up in the right wing of the ALP in the 1930s. What a change individuals can have. But they got out and the working class movement got them out. The ALP was confirmed as electable. This is good and bad. Imagine if we were like Canada and we never had a Labor Party in government, we just had two Tory parties. Labor was confirmed as electable in part because Labor proved that the right wing of Labor would support capitalism. But imagine if we had been under the equivalent of today's National Party for 80 years without break. So it is a win, it's a nasty tasting win, but it's a win. Labor was also allowed to maintain a radical element of itself in its left, as long as you weren't a communist or a member of an illegal organisation or you took it too far or you got in bed with the wrong people or you turned on the wrong bureaucrat in a meeting. The other thing that I think we should really consider as a win coming out of this strike is that in the mass unions, the new unions, an anarchistic, a revolutionary spirit was confirmed as allowable for a long period of time, up until about the 1980s. And also the spirit that Australia's unions should be industrially organised was felt by the left, the entire left of the Australian labour movement for a very, very long time. That our unions should be in closer unity with one another and we should organise not on the basis of skill or craft, ideally, and this is only the left opinion, but we should organise by industry to fight the bosses. So thank you, everyone. All right. Just let me... There we go. Okay, so we... Uh...